this point uh, because it's what it is. All right. Uh -huh. Moderators, please get our minds up. Brother Gregory, there you are. Hey, Ms. Rhonda, good to see you today. Hope you're gleaned today in our teachings. We're just going to read the writ. And remember, everyone, we're here for a sake of what we call, <clears throat> this is a Bible book club. It's a book club. It's not a Apostle Jones teaching session, <laughs> though you'll probably get that. But it's for us to discuss what we've read together and put into perspective the intentions of our creator. And uh, in doing so, we get a greater uh, perspective on what Yahweh really wants for us to do and how he wants us to operate in the earth in spite of the world contending with us on so many levels and fronts. All right, moderator is going to post a note from the last session where we left off in Bell Sheets, Genesis chapter 12. We'll be picking up at 13.1 after this word of prayer. Let us pray. Yahweh, we love you. You are Elohim. There is none like you. Uh, there is none above you. There is none beside you. You are holy and you are whole. You are righteous and you are our Elohim. How I love you today. And I thank you for these, your people, as we all come together. We are asking you to grace us with your spirit and your joy, with your peace. We're asking you to share with us all things that we need to know regarding and how we should operate in your plan, as it were. Uh, and so, Yahweh, we acknowledge you right now, literally in all of our ways. You can direct our path. We also take opportunity to repent for any and all sin. Sometimes we don't even realize how much we sin. Uh, just because we haven't done the big egregious, well known sins does not mean that we have not yet error in how we talk with someone, thought about someone, uh, conducted ourselves uh, with people of service, business, or industry, or whatever, whatever it may be. So, Yahweh, whatever your word brightens our life up. Light and the light in our life up to show us we've done. Help us, I pray you, to confess and just simply repent. Uh, for you would that none of us perish, but all would come to repentance. So Yahweh, please, we come before you now, acknowledging that without you, we can do nothing. But because of you, all things are absolutely possible. All right. So let us prepare our hearts in this time. Book of Bersheets, chapter 13. Genesis chapter 13, verse 1 is where we'll begin, but I am going to back up and go to chapter 12 just to bring us into context of where we are. Uh, moderators, you're going to first tell us why we're here, and then we're going to have moderators give us our points. As a matter of fact, let's not go into why we're here today. Let's go directly into the points from last week. Um, where are we with the points? Just give a few points so we can get right into it. Yes, sir. Shalom, everyone. Thank you for joining us today in the Bible Book Club. These are your notes from June the 23rd, 2022. If you would look at the top of the page, you can grab your notes and bring them down and read along with me. So we began at Better Sheets 12, 3, and we ended at chapter 13. Just a few key notes from the group A's uh, session that I thought was important. Um, Abram was wealthy and he was deemed a sheik. Now in regards to verses 12, better sheets 12, verse seven and eight, the altars were built, um, they were built um, up until the temple was established and they were like telling testimonies of what Yahweh had done. Now these altars that were erected were landmarks. They marked areas, and they did tell a story. Another key point is, for instance, this altar built by Avram in verse 7 and 8 at Bethel, his grandson Jacob comes back to that same spot. Now, this is where and when his name was changed to, changed to Israel. This spot is where he sleeps that night and wrestles with the angel. And that supporting scripture is better sheets 32, 22 through 31. We are to please remember that altars prior to the tabernacle, particularly the altars built by Abraham, are telling a tale. They are leaving markers for the sons who would come after him, and they would know these regions. Another key point is that when Abraham comes to Egypt, he wasn't just with um, Sarai. He came with everyone and everything they had. Another key point 
um, and then I'm going to turn it back over. It is when they were they were with Pharaoh. It is clear that Elohim spoke to Pharaoh, and Pharaoh knew who Elohim was. You have some phenomenal notes here because we had an amazing lesson. Please take the time to read them later in your own time. Apostle, back to you. So grateful, and thank you again. We do have the best mods. All right, everybody, let's get into the writ today. Let's talk why and let's talk about, let's read from his book of writings and his instructions. What it is he wants us to see about Avram and this time in life. All right, Belshitz, Genesis chapter 13. But what I'm gonna do is push us back to chapter 12 and start at verse 12. And we will not stop in this chapter until we get to chapter 13, just to bring us back up to speed in spite of the beautiful notes that were copiously taken. Verse number 12, Belshitz chapter 12, verse 12. Therefore it shall come to pass when the Egyptians shall see you. This is Abram talking to his wife, Sariah. He says that they will kill me but they will save you alive. Verse 13, Belshitz 12, 13. Avram says, say, I pray you, you're my sister, that it may go well with me for your sake and for my soul, uh, I shall live because of you. Verse 14 says, and it came to pass that when Avram was come into Egypt and the Egyptians beheld the woman, that was very fair. Just like he told them, they're gonna find you beautiful. Verse 15. The princesses also of Pharaoh saw her and commended her before Pharaoh. And the woman was taken into Pharaoh's house. And Abram, he, was entreated well for Sariah's sake. And Abram had sheep, he had oxen, he had asses, he had men servants, he had maid servants, she asses and camels. Verse 17, and Yahweh plagued Pharaoh's house with great plagues, 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 because of Sariah, who was Avram's wife. Verse 18 says, and Pharaoh called Avram and said, man, what is it that you have done unto me? Why, why, why did you not tell me that this woman was your wife? Why did you say she's my sister? So I might have taken her to my wife. Now, listen, you and your wife, take your stuff and go your way. Pharaoh also commanded all of his men concerning Avram. And they sent Avram and all of his people, all of his goods away. He, his wife, and all that he had. Now, the interesting thing that I found before we get moving on to further and more deep elements here is the fact that we see where, in fact, the word is requiring us to note that uh, Avram uh, is one, uh, he, he has a lot of stuff. He's got a lot of camels, he's got a lot of maids, men servants, asses, she asses, camels, yada, yada. He's a wealthy man. He's got a beautiful wife. He's got a, he got a little crew. We got a crew that protects each other at night, you know, in case the marauders trying to come in. They got a, they got a crew that can fight. They're well trained. He's also very wealthy, and uh, Pharaoh is also one who acknowledges that something about Abram is different. And the idea here is to understand that though we like to say that Elohim is acknowledged and notified and spoken of in the days of Moshe. Elohim was also known in the days of Avram as well. There are so many things that have taken place um, before Moshe comes about Yahweh that we don't really take time to uh, watch and vet out and flesh out. So let's look closely here at what happened in verse number uh, 17 of Belshitz chapter 12. Yahweh plagued Pharaoh. He plagued Pharaoh. He put something on him and his house. He plagued them with great plagues. That word plagues is plural. Uh, because Sariah, 
who was Abram's wife, was in his care, in his keep, in his space. And we, we, we need to pay attention uh, to that because it puts you in mind that you, you know, we say this thing in the world today, we got this little uh, catchphrase now, this little thing that's gone viral. Um, um, you know, I'm, 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 oh, what's that? Uh, I'm about mine. I'm about mine. Is that what it is? I'm about mine. Um, yeah. Um, oh man, what's the phrase? I just had a tip I'm talking to. I'm serious about mine. You know, don't 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 mess with mine. You know, don't anything that's mine. Don't mess with it. Yahweh basically tells Pharaoh, you know, bro, this ain't gonna go well for you or your or your wives or your children. All of y'all got something. Uh, y'all got a lot of different plagues. There's a multiplicity of plagues. The Bible says that Yahweh, Yahweh, Yahweh plagued Pharaoh's house with verse 17. So by the time Pharaoh got tired of the nose, the, the runny nose and the congestion and the and the boils and the pox and the mumps and the measles, uh, and, and I don't know. No, Corona might have been around back then. I don't know. Omarion and and the Delta variant. I don't know. I'm just putting it out there. You know, they got plagued that kid in their house, and I think everybody got something different. You know, but Yahweh will be. He's about his. He he he's serious. He don't. That's what it is. He don't play about his. And so, because of Sariah being in his house wrongly, um, Yahweh plagued the entire house with great plagues. All right, so we know that that's what took place. So let's go down to verse chapter 13. We know now that this is going to be a uh, continuation of what that looks like. So in verse number 13, Genesis, Belshitz, chapter 13, verse one, Avram went up out of Egypt because you just saw Pharaoh say, man, get out of here. Take your stuff, y'all, let them go. Don't bother them. I don't care what we bless them with. Get all of their camels. I don't even want, I don't even want the sheep dog down here. Get the sheep dog out. Don't let nothing stay. Avram went out of Egypt, he and his wife. And I love this next phrase we overlook. And all that he had. And Lot went with him. They went into the south. And Avram was very rich in cattle. He was very rich in silver. He was very rich in gold. And he went on his journeys from the south, even unto Bethel. Now, Bethel is very interesting because Bethel is the phrase and the name that he labeled this particular place where he made an altar to Yahweh. And we also find later on his son Itzhak comes through that way. His son, his grandson Jacob comes through that way too. And uh, he goes there and he calls it El Bethel, right? Uh, but Avram calls it El, or Avram calls it Bethel. Beth meaning house, El meaning God, right? Our Elohim, house of Elohim. Uh, uh, and, and to this day, it's it's a place that has been uh, attributed to a Palestinian region. But at the day, this was where he had come and built an altar unto Yahweh out of respect and honor for Elohim. Now, this is where it gets a little bit interesting for me as well. He he does this thing. He builds his altar. Calls the place Bethel, uh, and um, verse four says, verse three says, he 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 went on his journey from the south, even to Bethel, unto the place where his tent had been at the beginning of what we now know as his narrative. Now, this was a place between Bethel and High. Unto the place of the altar which he had made there at the first, and there Avram called upon the name of Yahweh. Now, verse 5 says, And Lot also, which went with Avram, well, he had flocks, he had herds, he had tents, meaning he had servants. And the land, verse 6, was not able to bear them, that they might dwell together. You know, you got a lot of substance. You got to have uh, sustenance for that substance. He says, for their substance was great, so that they could not dwell together. Verse 7, 
and there was a strife between the herdmen of Abram's cattle and the herdmen of Lot's cattle. Oh, watch this. And the Canaanite and the Perizzites that dwelled in that land. I can but imagine the issue that they're having with all these beasts of burden, all these beasts of market, and having to feed them from the limited well streams and trials that have been prepared for shepherds who are coming through the regions. And they're waiting like we wait at gas stations to get fuel to get their particular herds fed. And it's time consuming, like exuberantly time consuming. And so there's constant beefing about who goes first, about who should be there, who shouldn't be there, what's really going on with that. And so they're beefing. Now, not only are they beefing with the people in the land, the Canaanites and the Perizzites, Lot and Avram's camps are, 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 are out there beefing with each other. Because there's just not enough sustenance in that region to sustain them. And it's frustrating having to go out of the way all the time somewhere else because somebody else got to a certain spot first. Then you can play all the jockey games and political games you want. It just happens, people. So they're ripping, they're beefing, they got, they got, they got, they got beat. Now, I want to pause here because the conversation has to start making a, a, a good picture of what took place. Who are these people? How many of you have always heard that Avram, you know, heard the voice of Elohim and he left? the land of his forefathers and Yahweh made him wealthy. Anybody? Come on, we in Bible Book Club. You all got microphones. I hope that you guys will take opportunity to respond and participate. I need y'all to do so. Um, Tamika, you need to contact me as well, please. Um, but I, I need y'all to, uh, to, 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 to put this into perspective. I need y'all to put this, uh, in your head, and I'm purposefully driving the bus slow. Because sometimes you can drive through a neighborhood and not ever appreciate the markets in the neighborhood, the people in the neighborhood, because you try to get to a place you preset. Now, Avram's storyline, narrative primarily, not all, but primarily has been said he um, was in the land of, of, of Haran, in the land of rather uh, uh, Chaldei. And, uh, you know, he was, he was told to leave his land of his forefathers. And he does. And when he comes out, then Yahweh blesses him. How many of y'all know that story to be? Uh, what, what they, is that, how many of y'all know that story? Rogers. All right, Elder. Yes, that's basically the way it's been portrayed. I mean, he went out with little or nothing, and then after he um, went to Egypt, and then when the when the king thrust him out, that's when he got all of his riches and wealth. But according to the scripture, what we're reading, it did not happen like that. I yield the mic. So before we go further into that, that's been the narrative that Avram had little to nothing, you know, he was good people. He was a solid citizen. Um, you know, he didn't start no mess, didn't start no drama. He and his pops, and then you got Lot, their nephew, and uh, they decent merchants. That moment of truth comes, that moment of opportunity comes, and Yahweh calls your name and selects you, and then you, from there, Yahweh empowers you, he blesses you, and he makes you wealthy. Anybody else? Have you pretty much heard it that way or? 
Rogers again. That finish, I didn't, I forgot a part. And the part that um, I specifically remember was accusing Abraham of being disobedient by taking Lot with him. They said that he told God, that at the time it was God, that God told him to leave his family and, and his land, but he was disobedient by taking Lot. And once again, I see. You, you just blacked out, Elder. I'm not sure if you're still speaking. I can hear us, but we can't hear you at all. All right. When she comes back on, just um, we'll let her finish her thought. So we know, as Elder said, you know, and she brought in a part of the narrative that we're going to talk about later on, but Abraham being considered disobedient by modern day Christendom and theologic circles of seminary, that uh, he was disobedient because of, you know, the command that he was given, leave, you know, your land of your forefathers. Well, Actually, the command was given to Torah. If you just listen to the story, read it rightly, you'll see the command went to the father. It wasn't given to Abraham, but Abraham, because he and his father had a relationship with Elohim, um, he did get the assignment. He understood the assignment, and uh, therefore they're gone. Ooh, apostle, what you talking about? Yep, 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 yep. Go read it. We're going to read it. You're going to see it. Just wait. So... Avram, you know, he, he's, Avram is wealthy. Avram is a very wealthy man. He is not a pulper. He is not lower than the bar. He is not in some low cesspool of social economic depression. Uh, Avram, not Avraham, Avram, he doesn't have any children yet. He doesn't, he doesn't have Sariah laughing at him yet. He, he doesn't have Hagar coming at him yet. Uh, he doesn't have, uh, you know, Isaac. He doesn't have Ishmael. All, he's, not, he's, not, he's not father of the nations yet. He is Avram, a great father. Uh, and so Avram starts his ministry. And, and I say ministry almost in fear because people will always misconstrue this. And we got people now talking about, oh, my, my ministry is this, and my ministry is that, and my ministry is this because they waited on their ministry. Your, your, our function is Elohim's. And it's, it's his, his alone. And he asks us to do it. Amen. And when he asks us to do it, we have to determine yes or no, we're going to do it and then do it his way. Otherwise, it is your ministry because you're going to do it your way. And yeah, there's a difference. There is a way that seems right unto a man, but in the end of his way, there's usually destruction. There's always going to be death. Death, death spiritually for you, you know, uh, whereas when you deplete this earthen vessel, you may have issue with ending up in a condition or place um, where you have eternal life at the end. So Avram is taking this leap of faith now, Abraham is different than most of us. Abraham is actually walking on the word of Elohim. Abraham is actually working on what Yahweh said to do. He is doing it, uh, and he is doing it, and very consciously and earnestly paying every ounce of attention to what Elohim is instructing him to do with signs. And wonders. One of the first signs of Abram is this one. Pharaoh's very rude, very aggressive. He's just, he, he can never get his full. And he has this proclivity for beautiful women. And that's just what that king does and could do. Abram knew his proclivity. He knew the nature 
the nurtured nature, the nurtured culture of this pharaoh, and just told his wife, "He's this guy is gonna you're, you fine. He gonna come at you. All right. So just don't don't take it the wrong way." Now, here's why I bring this part up. I don't want to go back into um, the fact that she's beautiful and the king can do what he wants. But Avram is. He's a sheik in his own right. He is one who has enough resources to take care of his family, his staff, his people born under his roof that are subservient and working alongside of him to fulfill his vision and get his family's business in a successful state. Lot, lot. Lot, Lot has the same elements, and therefore this family is technically a wealthy family. Because I, I raised the issue primarily to show that in order for Yahweh's kingdom to be built and be manifested so the world could see it and then have respect to it, is when you have a wealthy man who does not have to respect anyone because he can supply for himself, she can supply for herself. I mean, I'm not talking about she paying her rent, she paying, she washed her clothes, and she cooked her dinner too as uh, soon as she got home from work. I'm not I'm talking about that. I'm talking about someone who can literally start a war with his finances. He could literally uh, start a coup with his finances. He could literally, uh, you know, take care of the whole city when he comes in, uh, in his time zone. He can give up his, 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 his livestock that travels with him nomadically. And the people in that city, that country, that nation would deem him uh, a very high pollutant, high and influential uh, individual. So the purpose of this monologue is to help everyone see Moshe, pardon me, Avram was selected by Elohim. And in order for Yahweh to get his kingdom advanced in the earth at that time, he simply has it that he Elohim is going to do it using wealthy people because that's the influential piece. Yahweh does not use, watch this, it's going to offend some people, but don't let it offend you until you hear the whole process. Yahweh does not use, watch this, um, not wealthy people to begin his kingdom his kingdom in the earth, his efforts to cause it to manifest in the earth. He does not just use anybody and everybody to start it. He uses everybody in it, but he doesn't use everybody to start it. See, this is a problem for us within Christendom, primarily because uh, we always go for the people who are in need and then try to give them hope about our Messiah. And then in our getting them hope, they get hooked on our getting them hope. And then they begin to put their hope in man in some instances. And over time, even though it might start off, it ends up that they put this that gave them this hope on a pedestal and then that which gave them hope about the hope of messiah about the hope of the rapture had become their uh their worship place and so uh, we didn't realize that the person helping another person up uh, may not or may have been wealthy but because we only go to tell the story, it's easier to tell the story to people who don't have means than to try to tell it to people who have means and have already started building their own empires, their own kingdoms, as it were, their own nations within a nation, as it were. 
uh, their own microcosms of a nation. And, and so we don't bother them. We don't, not bother them, not like, like go after them, but, you know, we, we don't, we don't, we don't, we don't, we don't look to them except for philanthropic aid. And, and, and the truth is, Yahweh does not use those in need of philanthropic aid to actually help bring the manifested element of his kingdom to bear in our sights. He uses those who are already wealthy. And, but the point is, everybody can be. This is not a prosperity message. This is just something that we did not note enough in the writ about how wealthy Avram was. It's just like Moshe, you know, and, and, and Moshe uh, is where we have the quote unquote first church uh, come from. But Moshe was a wealthy man. Moshe lived 40 years as prince of Egypt. That's wealth. Massive. Then he spent 40 years as prince of Midian. Because Jethro was a sheik out there. He married Jethro's daughter, he is the son-in-law, and they are the wealthy in the region. And yet he hears the call of the burning bush, Yahweh from the burning bush, and now he is going to mandate this charge because I found it very interesting that Moshe left his family, the breadwinner, left his wife and children and went to answer this call. You can only do that when you have no issues, no qualms with the fact that you've left enough to support your family in your absence no matter how long you're gone. Now, I know a lot of people like to argue with these points and this argue with this piece, but I want you to get this so that you see it for what it is. Um, Yahweh uses the wealthy to establish his kingdom. Because it's the wealthy that's always looked up to. Round tree. And so while we move forward in these items of understanding how Yahweh wants to uh, get his kingdom going, we have to begin to prepare ourselves for this reality that Yahweh will always look to use anybody he deems fit to bring his vision to fruition. But. Starting his kingdom, getting it going, requires resource. And though he will use me, you, anyone, I mean, he can do anything. That's not what we're saying. But just look at his method of operation in clear report of his narratives and storylines with the people he's using. Every one of them were wealthy. I thought it was very amazing that Avram, as wealthy as he was, most wealthy people, when they, when they go off of a whim or a hunch or an investment or some new movement they feel that they're entering into, they look for what we call ROI. Their return on interest, their re their return on whatever they're putting forward, and if they don't get it in a certain time frame, uh, they may change course and take on a different uh, movement altogether. Scrap the one they started and then go with another one. But Avram, as a man of that nature, of that caliber, he doesn't do that. He stays with Yahweh. And here's the catch. Uh, when I go back to that part of us talking about, you know, Yahweh, you know, told Avram to go out into this land, I'm going to show you, and then Yahweh made Avram rich. That's not the case. Avram didn't leave on a word of faith saying, Yahweh's going to take me out here and make me wealthy. Avram wasn't worried about, in faith, the thing we have had preached to us. See, Avram believed God. He believed against hope, you know, uh, and, and, and that's why it's accounted to him for righteousness. That is very much true, but you put a spin on it that's got to go. 
Abraham is not out there in this wild place. He's not out there separated from his land he was nurtured and cultured in, wondering how he's going to take care of himself. His purse, his wallet is fat. He, he knows how he's going to take care of himself. The issue is, where is Yahweh leading me? I'm not worried about eating. I got enough allies and I got enough merchant connections. I can make things happen and I got my resources with me. You see my camels, you see my she asses, you see my asses, you see my oxen, you see my goats, you see my, you see everything I got. You see my servants. We got a little military. We got a little militia with us right now. So if you cut us, you might lose your life. Matter of fact, you will lose your life. So Abram is not that guy like many of us who say, well, I'm just jumping out here on faith and God going to provide. And, and then, then, and that, that's, that's that's not Avram's issue. Avram's not hoping Yahweh will provide. Avram's got provision in spades. His issue is he's heard the truth, and the truth has compelled him. And now he's listening to the truth, and he wants to know, where is the truth leading me? You're moving me from Chaldea. I was uncomfortable there anyway. I'm moving now in your direction. I just need to hear you. I I know this. I don't know what I'm going to do, but I know, I, I know there is more for me to do. I'm I'm blessed to be a blessing. This is the way I believe that Abraham's mindset and mentality is. And so as you're reading the narrative, you, you don't pay attention to the fact that he is a wealthy man. Can y'all admit, can y'all admit, can y'all admit, come off mic, let me know. Can y'all admit that this passage in, in, in chapter 12, make it very clear that Abraham is wealthy and rich in cattle and in flock and in servants? Yes, sir. Yes, yes he is. Yes, yeah. He really, he really is right, and this is the thing we need to understand. So I need y'all to catch this because it gets it gets extremely important. What does he do? Does he go out there and say, "Okay, God, I came out here. I left my dad. I left my family. Uh, you gotta, you gotta provide for me. I don't know what I'm." No, that's not his narrative. That's not his narrative. Buddy is blessed. Buddy is wealthily blessed. He can pick up and move steak at the drop of a hat. Most people who have that type of resource, uh, they don't see a proper kind of productive movement after a while. Uh, they tend to do, they tend to afford change. Premature, disobedient or not, they, they can afford any change they make. You ain't got to like the change they make but they can afford it and they can afford your judgment of it later too. So Avram doesn't have that problem. I just want us to really get that because in the next coming chapters, you'll see why that's important. Okay. But I have to stop here. I heard you, thank you. I have to stop here and make sure that everyone understands what this is for and what this is about. Roundtree, what, what is it you need to say, dear? Um, I just wanted to confirm what you're saying, Apostle, especially when it comes to mission work. A lot of missionaries and people who are sending people out kind of use that phrase of, well, not the phrase, excuse me, the, the scripture that says, you know, to leave your land, your home, and your country, and to go this place, and Yahweh will bless you when you get there. And so many have struggled yes. so hard reading and and yes and misinterpreting the scripture so i just wanted to to add that point that yes i see that yeah. taught and so you have to understand that this is not about you leaving where yahweh told you to go to and there he will make you blessed pay attention to what yahweh promised Abraham. everybody i need y'all attention do i have the right to show y'all that do i have your permission to show you something that yes, makes this point stronger yes Yes, sir. Okay, yes, sir. Uh, yes. Okay, okay, there you go. I need a few more people. Here's the, here's, the, here's the thing I want you to catch. Avram was not told to leave his father's land so he could be made rich. He was already rich. Avram was told to leave because Yahweh wanted to make his name great.
Amen. Yeah, that part. I'm going to say it again. Yahweh did not have Avram leave to make him rich. Avram, though he's not Avraham yet, Avram is still a rich man. And he don't need more riches. But apparently he sought and sought after purpose. And Yahweh says, leave where you are and I'll make your name great. Calde had a lot of wealthy men. Calde had a lot of wealthy men. But Yahweh says, Avram, leave that place. Go where I'm going to show you. I'm going to make your name great. I'm going to make your name great. That means the man's already wealthy amongst wealthy people. All right, so um, I think I heard um, Spencer, Pastor Spencer, how are you, Shalom? Shalom, Apostle. I think you just answered my question, so I should have been a little bit more patient. I wanted to uh, bring up part of the question Elder, or statement Elder Rogers had made when she said that we've also been taught in Christendom that Avram was disobedient because he took Lot with him when they left um, Chaldean. But when it, when it reads in, in Genesis t- um, 12, I think I wanted to go back to that. Um, and he said, leave thy father's house. It wasn't leaving the family members. It was leaving the city or the place where they resided. Is that correct? They did not. They 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 left the they left the residence. They left the general geographical area. Uh, But if you read verse four, Abraham didn't take him with him. Lot knew that there's favor on Abraham's life. Look at what verse four says in Belshazzar chapter twelve. So Abraham departed as Yahweh had spoken unto him, and Lot went with him. That's right. It, it didn't say Abraham invited him. Lot went with his uncle. Lot don't have his father. Matter of fact, if you don't have if you don't have Lot's participation in this narrative, Christendom has a completely different set of testimonies that will come out of. It. And, and this is where, like, Pastor Spencer and Pastor Rogers are showing us we've been taught, you know, a certain thing because it was convenient, it was quick, and it helped pave a little pathway to a point the presenter was trying to make. Um, but how many of you know that there are many, 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 many thoughts in a man's mind, but the will of Elohim has always got to be the prevailing point? Pastor Spencer, I'm sorry I didn't mean to cut you off. No, you you answered. Um, I thank you. You answered my question. Yeah, we be praised. And so, a lot went with Abraham. Abraham didn't take him. Elder Rogers, you out there too? Did you make your fix? You in a you in a good area now, Elder Rogers? Yes, yes. All right, because we lost you for a while there when you were talking about that piece. Yes. Um, I- but but you but we all see now clearly if you read the writ Lot went with him. It did not say that he drug Lot. That's how it reads. It, you know, it just does not read that he drug Lot off the. You coming with me? No, it says that Lot went. With Abraham. Lot's a full grown, wealthy, rich man. He can make his own shots, his own calls. And what people don't remember is how uh, or know enough about is Terah, Abraham's father. Yahweh mentions him for reasons. Terah is one who is sensitive to Yahweh. 
even in the land of Chaldea, where Yahweh is just a part of the uh, God cache, which is, I really believe, why Yahweh uh, made the commandment, you'll have no other gods before me. When you come to worship me, you'll have no other gods before me. Like you, in your time past, shared uh, your attention with other gods, demigods, but do not do not do what you all did in those days. Give me all the due that I require, uh, but don't share me and don't don't put other demigods. Don't 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 group. There, there's none above me. There's none beside me. So don't put any in the same you know space with me because that's what they did in Calde. If you don't believe that, then go go fast forward and. Let's talk about um, um, one of Avram's family members named uh, Laban, who, uh, you know, Itzhak married. Or, no, pardon me, pardon me, pardon me, pardon me, pardon me. Re 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 Rebecca, uh, uh, who marries uh, Itzhak, is from Laban. Uh, but the storyline that you want to read about is when Jacob goes and then 20 something years later, Jacob leaves and the daughters of Laban from the land that Avram comes from literally has this cachet of God. And what irritated Laban was when Jacob left, he thought Jacob did it but his wives did it, which were Laban's actual daughters. They knew how much he loved the worship of his gods, that they took his idols. When they left, they knew it would break his heart. And then to cover it so that it did not look like Jacob had done it, which he did not, they didn't want to get him in trouble, though he was tried by Laban. Um, you know, uh, Rachel, who is, you know, with Cycle at this part of the month, um, she hides them under her pillows in her tent. And when woman is in Cycle back then, they didn't have, you know, Tampax, Tampon. They, they had a whole different system to deal with that matter. You were away from people. You were in a tent. Uh, there's reasons for that. I don't, I don't want to have to get bolder here, but there's reasons for that tent being, uh, you know, the tent of, you know, that. So uh, they wouldn't go in that tent, you know. He might have hollered through the window or hollered through the tent cloth, like, yeah, Raquel, you, 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 you see what's happening? You know, my my altar has been torn down. The gods, my idols are gone. <laughs> and she's like, oh, uh, wow, interesting. I don't know, I see. Well, okay, well, I'm on cycle, Dad, so I, I can't come out and hug you. Roger. And she's sitting on the idols. All right, I got to get back. I don't want to get off on that chance there, but I, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to back up now. Um, I think I heard Dr. Stewart. Thank you, uh, Pastor um, um, Pastor Spencer, and thank you, Elder Rogers, for your ad. Uh, Dr. Stewart, you have something you want to share? Yes, when you were talking about Abraham see, not seeking wealth, but seeking purpose, it reminded me of Solomon when he blessed the temple and Yahweh said, I'll give you whatever you want. And he asked for purpose and knowledge instead of wealth. And I believe that was a reference back to maybe not mentally but spiritually back to Abraham not seeking right synonymous seeking purpose right because it wasn't about the money he already had the money he already had the, the, money. the thing the thing that the thing that blows my mind about Solomon with which would be a decent parallel to what Abraham is dealing with and synonymously speaking wisdom um, would sort of suggest in certain issues purpose but um solomon's dad was david um there was no 
possibility of lack in what David had done before he turned the reins over to Solomon. And Solomon inherited a very wealthy, robust kingdom and a set of alliances and a set of, uh, you know, tributes of homage uh, coming to the king of Israel from its affiliate nations that he his children's children would never ever go broke okay um so when Solomon is dedicating in Sukkah uh the 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 feast the the, the, the tabernacle the temple rather now that it's been built replacing the tabernacle he dedicates it in that Sukkah and he tells Yahweh, I, you know, uh, I, Yahweh says, I'll give you what you want because you, you've been, you've been, you've been straight up about me and my Torah, like your dad has been. And so he says, well, you know, I just seek wisdom and understanding that I might lead your people. He's already wealthy. Solomon had no need for anything. The temple he built. <sighs> The price tag on that piece of property is still the most expensive piece of real estate in history. And then his house, which he built later, is equally of renown. This wasn't a matter of them being wealthy. They knew there was more. That's why the Chronicles of Solomon and the Proverbs that he writes and the Songs of Solomon those things are, are extremely important. Solomon was already wealthy. He, he, he could afford that ridiculous sacrifice that he rendered. Now, the sacrifice was also connected to the feast. It was connected to the people of the area having been taxed so heavy to get the temple done that Solomon makes sure that everybody has a sacrifice that was required by Yahweh on the time of the dedication and the feast, because he had the dedication during the feast of Sukkah. Everybody was supposed to come with something. Many could not because of the taxation. Temple built, long story. We'll get that in some other day. But yeah, he did not have lack of wealth, but he did want the wisdom and knowledge to lead the people the way his father did. That makes your name great. And y'all can tell about Solomon all y'all want. I, I think he made it in. I really do. We all make mistakes. We all do dumb things. Can't just, you know, everybody, it's weird how people do, you know, somebody can do a million wonderful things and they do half a bad thing. And all of a sudden, all the million wonderful things they did and for you uh, get scrubbed because of reputation or because of perceived, uh, you know, bias within a community. And we got to end that. So uh, great point, Dr. Stewart. Um, I have to concur. All right. Who was next on cue? Elder Rogers, then Unstoppable. Elder Rogers? Elder Rogers? Elder Rogers? All right. Unstoppable? Yeah, so I was going to ask, I never knew that they took the idols because they wanted to make him upset oh yeah because you, you, you know what what they did to him but they what 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 when they when they learned of what laban had done remember laban was he was debaucherous he he was right. just Okay. Think about the first thing that they did and they had to settle for it because they were young. This was twenty years ago when they first met Yaha. They were their father's servants. They were their father's daughters. They did not have husbands. And so when Laban found out how prof pro profitable it was having Jacob, uh, he concocted or he enacted a statue on their books that he could have bypassed. But he, 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 he said, man, how do I keep this guy with me another few years? You know what I mean? He ain't got nothing. I'm giving him room and board. These seven years, I've prospered like hundredfold. You know, this is fire. How do I keep him here? And then he comes up with the issue on their books. You know, the, the, the oldest daughter must marry out first, but doesn't tell him. He doesn't tell Jacob that was what it was. And then he gets the girls to do it at the last minute. 
I mean, think about that. I, I they they knew how low down their dad was. I think they got a little bit, of, little they they saw a little bit of vengeance, you know, uh, on their own. Now, I I'd like to run a comparison to see which of the sons and daughters, uh, which of the sons came from which, uh, which of the sons that really hit Shechem hard when Tamar was raped, um, and. Uh, which ones they were. I know it was Levi and I want to go back down whose sons they were because that's sort of kind of a thing that they did. They sought revenge, even though everything was supposed to be Gucci and walled over and worked out. They, they was like, nah, uh-uh, it ain't going to go down like that. We, you're going to feel this. So they were really, you know, granted they stood by their man, but their man got dogged out by their dad. And there were times they couldn't do anything about it because their dad was the king. You know, their dad was, you know, he was head person in charge. So they knew what Jacob went through and he didn't even complain. They didn't know the blessing on his life until later, but they experienced it. They just didn't understand it, you know, as they would later on. That's why they went ahead and like, well, we're going to exact uh, this on our dad because our dad also shorted us. In our dowry, he shorted us in the father's gift to his daughter. Oh, I didn't think about see, that. People, people don't pay attention to that, you know, because whenever you get married, like they were given, each daughter had a servant, had a had a woman servant, just like Soraya from the same region, Avram's daughter, Avram's wife, had a a, a, a maid servant that was an indentured servant you know, as the, a servant to her. And so that was a common piece, but there were also some other things they were supposed to get. Laban being greedy, you know, and his boys, you know, they being masculine driven, doing what they do. So I, there was some family unrest there. We'll read more about that just a couple chapters away from here, though. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Wanda. Miss Wanda. I wanted to go back just a little bit, um, back to chapter 13, um, I think it's the second verse, where it begins to name that Avram had cattle and silver and gold. And in 12, it just Uh, says he has substance. uh, So uh, uh, is there a purpose uh, for that? don't, Don't do that. Don't do that. Don't do that. Where are you at? Huh? You said that in verse two, right? You said that it's the Adam. Yeah, I'm the sorry. Av- in, in in verse one, no, two. It says an Avram was very rich in right. cattle. Okay. What, what I stopped you for was because you said it, and it said in verse two that Avram had cattle. Okay. The, uh, no, it didn't say Avram had. It said Avram was rich. Uh, was rich. And so is there a significant? Yeah. Very rich. Yeah. Very yeah. rich. We so said, had, I, is, hey, wait, ho, ho, no, I can have three head of cattle. I can have a, 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 a bullion of silver and a bullion of gold. This joker was very rich in cattle, very rich in silver, comma, and very rich in gold. Well, you don't just, you don't stop the very rich part. Just because I'm sorry. The I had to pull it up. I needed, yeah, I need to pull your coat on that one. I had to pull it up to see it. I'm, yes, I'm yes. the driver. I'm sorry. Well, it said that he had cattle, and then it said <laughs> in the next verse that you know he had flocks and herds and tents. You know, uh, no, no, That's he was very. He didn't have. He was very, very rich in cattle, silver, and gold. Go ahead, finish your story. So why is it? in chapters 12 that it's just substance but when we get to 13 a few things are actually named now and it says very rich did he get something from the egyptians because they were like get out uh, go that's why that's yeah let's go down there because you can't you can't not connect that go back down to verse number 12 uh no go down to verse number go to verse number 16 
And the princesses saw the, of verse 15. The princesses saw Pharaoh, she was fine. They commended her to Pharaoh, took her to Pharaoh's house. Verse 16. And Pharaoh entreated Abram well for her sake, colon, semicolon. Uh, co sorry, colon. It says, and Avram had sheep, had oxen, had asses, had men servants, had maid servants, had asses, had camels. This is what I was trying to tell y'all to uh, the first week when we were reading chapter twelve that Avram tells this his wife, look. We won. He's going to keep you alive because all of this belongs to you. What we're going to come to his door with, his men are going to know you're well kept. They're going to know you're fine. And then when they see you, they're going to see you're fine based on how we present and walk to this gate. Y'all got to remember, Lot came with cattle. Lot came with men servants, asses, ox, sheep, camels. And Abram came with the same. This group right here though a small militia our military can take y'all but let's just be feasible let's just be you know political let's just be you know let's 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 be uh let's be let's be friendly now if i like your wife i'm taking her if you want to come through this land but it, it and we never pay attention to the fact that i've had all of that at presentation and all it says here is that Pharaoh entreated Avram well for Sariah's sake. Well, what that meant, too, was that Pharaoh did not have to offer them cattle, food, lodging, an area that they could go to. He basically pulled out the red carpet for them and told their servants until I figure out what I'm going to do with this girl here. Uh, let's look out for Abraham, Sariah's brother. That might get me good favor with Soraya. You know what I mean? So let's just uh, show her how we do, folks, since that's her brother. You know, no reason to kill him. He ain't going to be coming for her. He'll be good. Me and him could probably do a little bit of allegiance. There's a lot more that plays into the narrative of the story than many people, particularly preachers of Christendom, have ever really talked about to show why, one, Abraham has respect. If Abraham did not have what Abraham had, Coming to that gate of Egypt, he may not have received the type of entreatment that he got. Now, granted, the God of, of, of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob would have still spoken to knucklehead, uh, the, the, the Pharaoh here, but we don't know how that narrative would have turned out. These mansions are significant. They, 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 they set the foundation for what Yahweh is saying. People don't respect you when you don't have. When you do have, people respect you, and they had respect unto Abraham, one for what he had, but he was entreated with what he had well because of the interest in the perceived daughter, a, a sister called Sariah, who was in fact, as you and I know, wife, uh, but technically sister. So, yeah. He, he had it, it's it's our chapter 12 already explained to us what he had people think when they read this let me read verse 6 again some people think that the storyline is about pharaoh and pharaoh entreated avram well for her sake and it sounds like he he gave avram sheep he gave avram asses oxes men servants maid servants asses and camels that's not what happened that's how i've heard it preached literally me too. Pharaoh didn't, give, Pharaoh didn't give him anything. When you hear he got men servants and maid servants, these maid servants can fight and will cut your throat as quick as Abraham said, kill him. Y'all didn't know these yet. Y'all didn't know that Abraham was a thug. Yes. Y'all didn't know Abraham was a thug. I didn't I, know. I didn't know that. Playback is no. He loved life, but don't come for him. Y'all don't remember? Let me show you. Let me let me give you a little refresher so since y'all don't remember. Abram had a problem when this, these five kings went into a place called Sodom and Gomorrah and just took and ran roughshod all through the land and Lot and all his goods got kidnapped. 
Abram took his 319 men that were in his camp and went up against five militaries. Oh, I remember. Yeah, yeah I remember that. Remember that. Abram is a thug. You heard me? In a in a good way. He 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 bout that life. <laughs> he bout that I life. Apostle Spencer, I think he had like three hundred men with him against those five kings yeah. in their arm. Um, three hundred yeah. he, he had three hundred and nineteen men and they went up against them and they beat the five kings and got back they beat the five kings and got seven kings worth of bounty and dowry. This, Minister Wanda, is also where people think Avram got rich at. Well, Apostle, I, I did know he had, you know, I understood that Pharaoh took care of what they brought. I just thought that maybe because it was being mentioned that he threw some extra stuff at him to get out. Well, you got you got to understand the nature and the mentality of monarchy. You got to understand kings and kings of back then. And you know, uh, you if you if you tick them off, uh, it's off with your head. The fact that they didn't die. He came at him like, "Yo, man, what did you do? Why you tell me this was your sister, bro?" That 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 tone. It's time to die. The guards are pulling their sheaves, the swords out of their sheaves at that moment. Everybody gonna die. Everybody go night night. So for them to walk out of there, the, the the blessing that Pharaoh gave was tell even my men and my generals who see them leaving the region don't exact revenge. Because remember, the Pharaoh's house is plagued with disease because of their existence. This is their king who has a cold because y'all came. Long live the king is a serious thing. Because the king is the reason we live so well. He let you slide, but yeah, it ain't going to happen. I mean, that's not going to happen. You're you going to die on the other side of the border. Just cross over. We're going to get you. <laughs> and that right there is a favor uh, extension, Minister Wanda. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Thank you. So, 13, we go back here. I'm, I'm going to end here because this is where we stopped at for the uh, earlier group, too. We can pick all this up. So, we'll pick up in verse number eight uh, to deal more with this. But did anybody learn anything about the fact that Abram was far more wealthy than we may have first perceived and he did not get his wealth as he went along? <laughs> With Yahweh walking, his wealth was simply increased. Let me say this. His person was not increased unto wealth. <laughs> his wealth <laughs> was increased along the way. There's a difference. You and I, our person would be increased unto wealth, right? But no, his already existing wealth was increased. He was Avram, a wealthy man. And um, by the time he had had children, according to prophecy, he became father of many nations. And those nations, those children he had, were just as wealthy as he, thereby this patriarch. Yeah, he, he's the, he's, his name is great. They sing about him to this day. Father Abraham. Right. I just wanted to share that because when you see little small nuances like that, it makes you slow down when you're reading the writ. Because most people read the writ to get to a point they think they want to be at. And that point may be a conversation they had with somebody down the block. I'm like, yeah, let's get to verse 8 real quick. No, slow down. Slow down and read everything. Don't don't go past it. The story takes on so many different flavors, so many different aromas, so many different textures, so many different brilliant lights and prisms. Man, listen, 
read the rich slow and you'll see where these things connect later. I promise you, this conversation is going to come up twice before we leave <laughs> the book of Belshiks. All right, anybody else? Real quick, I'll give you 60, 30 seconds. Anybody? I learned Jordan Rice. Hey, Jordan. I knew about the uh, I knew about the king. I knew about the king, but I didn't know what you just said. So that part was pretty interesting to us. I didn't know that uh, women were warriors, but it, it would make sense in that song, or as far as that. Yeah. Was, yeah. yeah. Hey, bro. They there's a there's a there's a there's a, there's a reputation that Soraya carried a big stick. That's what they called it. <laughs> oh, girl could throw down. Yeah, she was that. Yeah, she she was that ride or die. Like, yeah, you, you uh, she hey, look, she don't play about hers. You know, and that's that's real talk. And I can tell you right now, we can give you some stories of some women warriors back then that would literally take down kingdoms. I mean, take them down. For real, for real. So if I'm not mistaken, they were over there in the African, maybe uh, Southern Asia. So, I, I mean, it, it would definitely would make sense at that time. But it's just yeah. you don't think about. Yeah, we don't we don't think about it because we are sitting in a law, supposedly law, protect and serve, you know, situation where we're not in the wild wild west anymore, you know. Uh, and but it does make pure sense back in that day. They got to protect themselves. Um, and I always tell men, look, y'all stop slowing, being slow on these women. They can do everything a man can do. Physically, it's just a matter of them getting conditioned. I've got some personal friends that can out bench press me and uh, out squat me, out burby me, uh, and 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 can punch pretty hard too. And will hit you like you was a man. And you will act, you will think you got hit by a man when they hit you. It's just the fact that it's muscle, and they can train themselves to do anything a man can do. Problem is, once a woman starts training herself to come physically that fit, that dominant, that's a that's a scary threat. Uh, now, wait a minute, Apostle. You know, women, no, bro, women are made after men. They are the ones who were given the new and improvements uh, that the first human did not get, uh, you know, and they can have babies. They bring whole lives into this world. And, and and some of them laugh through the delivery process. I'm like, what? Why are you laughing? Ah, when I get off this table, I'm gonna take you. Listen, y'all, y'all sedate her, please. Did did the, the, the thing? Can y'all please just put it down, put it under? You know. So that was funny. You ain't have to laugh. I liked it. it All really right. It was funny. It was. <laughs> mm. All right, everybody, let's pray out. We're going to go ahead and let this go. We'll come back, moderators. Please make sure you take notes and make sure that we have this. Oh, not make sure, but I'm asking you and thanking you for your copious notes that you guys do take. But remember who Avram is. He is he is a certain person before he becomes Avraham, father of many nations. All right, let's take opportunity, moderators. Tell us why we're here. We'll pray out. Shalom, everyone, and good evening. Thank you so much for joining us tonight at the Bible Book Club. We are here every Thursday at 1 p.m. and 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. We want you to know, please join us tomorrow under our other club, The Proceeding Word. We're there every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. We are Sabbath keepers here, and we will return for Sabbath studies. Friday night at 11 p.m. And that's under the Darash Kingdom Ministries Club. So Friday nights at 11 p.m. and Saturday mornings at 11 a.m. And then under Darash, you can join us again on Sundays at 10, 15 a.m. for our tomorrow after Sabbath service. And we have a weekly Bible study every Wednesday night at 7 p.m. All of these clubs can be found if you click on Apostles Profile. Scroll down to the bottom and look for the preceding word, Bible Book Club, and Arash Kingdom Ministries. 
replays are on for this room, but you can also find all of our previously recorded uh, rooms, including Proceeding Word and our Sabbath studies on our Facebook page at BWJ Ministries. Apostle, back to you. You're on mute, sir. Thank you. Sorry, 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 guys. Uh, well, again, thank you so very much for all of you who have tuned in and are here. Um, and we are going to uh, hope that you have a wonderful Shabbat coming up. Those of you who've entered Shabbat, Shabbat Shalom to you. Those of you who will be entering in. No, this is Thursday. Y'all not ready yet. Sorry. That's tomorrow. So we'll see you tomorrow for Proceeding Word, all right? Let's pray out. Yahweh, we love you. Thank you. Magnify you. I'm so excited about Shabbat Shabbat. I need, I'm waiting for my rest this week. Yahweh, I need you. Please send rest to your servant. And Father, we thank you right now for all these great servants who have desired to come and at least talk about your word and talk about your intention <coughs> and talk about your, 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 your method of operation so that we understand you better and have a relationship and know how to activate faith in a greater way. For without faith, it's impossible to please you, Yahweh. Faith comes by hearing. Hearing comes by your word. Your word <clears throat> is our lamp and light to our pathway and our feet. We ask you now, give it to us as we search you for it. And when we find you, please just pour it on us. We'll sit and take it as long as you give it. In the mighty name of Yeshua HaMashiach, we all pray and we say, Amen. All right, everyone, it's been a joy. We'll see you soon. This room will end in five, four, three, two. Shalom. Shalom, everyone. Shalom, everyone. Shalom, everyone. Thank you.